And of course, there are other descriptions of self-dual uh, metrics which make it first order problem. For example, twister description of self-dual metrics makes the equations first order. And it's just Einstein-Hilbert that makes it second order. Uh, then I'll talk about nonlinear theory and I hope I, I will have time. I actually want to show you how you can work with this connection formulation I, and I want to describe to you how spherically symmetric solution is obtained so that you, you see how to put this formulation to work. So let me start uh, with some generalities and well, let, let me describe what happens in the case of Maxwell theory uh, where, well, we all know it and we will, it's the simplest possible field theory. Uh, so Maxwell theory is based on, well, this, this complex, right? We have uh, gauge transformation parameters leaving. These are functions on space time. Uh, our fields are connections on space time, so one forms and curvature are two forms. And then Lagrangian, well at least, yeah, for Maxwell, for Maxwell, Lagrangian is just dA squared. If we were working with Yan Mills, we would have more indices here. It, was be, it would be tensored with some Lie algebra, and then there would be other nonlinear parts in this Lagrangian, but the linear aspect of the Lagrangian would still be that. In four space-time dimensions, there is something happening, something special happening. We can split uh, the space of two forms into lambda plus and lambda minus, and then we can introduce projections. So this exterior derivative, we can project it on lambda plus and lambda minus, call it d plus d minus. Uh, this is a very useful way because then we can characterize, well, first of all, we can rewrite uh, Maxwell equations in vacuum as this equation. Uh, the fact that the composition of these two arrows gives us zero. This is equivalent to Maxwell equations. And then, uh, but as you can see, particularly particular set of solutions to these Maxwell equations written in this form is d plus a is equal to zero. <coughs> and these are particular helicity of photons. So one can get, uh, in this for formalism, one can get uh, photons of one helicity very nicely. And this, of course, one can call that cell-dual configurations. These are first-order equations satisfied by the field. So this is a very nice description of photons. It works for Jan Mills as well. Uh, then let's compare this with Einstein-Hilbert. In the case of Einstein-Hilbert, linearized, linearized around, for example, flat space, one gets much more of a mass as a linearized Lagrangian. Uh, in particular, the thing to note here is that the two uh, irreducible representation of Lorentz group that participate in this Lagrangian, right? One is the trace-free part of H mu nu. The other one is a trace. They both appear in this linearized Lagrangian. Partially, the, the reason why this Lagrangian is so complicated is because it involves, you see, it involves both H and H mu nu. So this is part of the reason why it's more complicated because that, these two, two fields play an equally important role. Uh, this Lagrangian is invariant on the um, linearized deformorphisms. Uh, one can also derive this as the only Lagrangian uh, for H mu nu, which is invariant under this linearized deformorphism modular, say topological term and field redefinitions. Uh, but the important point about this Lagrangian is unlike what happens for the case of Maxwell, but this is not a square of any first order. There is some second order operator appearing here. It's not a square of any first order operator. Uh, this is, for example, clear from the fact that it doesn't have a definite sign. Right? The signs in, in front of these two terms are different and this, the fact that, well, this term has a wrong sign in front of it is sometimes referred to as conformal mode problem in gravity. Uh, Euclidean Lagrangian is not bounded from below, just precisely because of this term. Uh, also, if you remember what was happening for Maxwell, there was some underlying complex here, and the fact that Lagrangian is just, well, you, you basically Lagrangian is built on this complex, right? Lagrangian is you take your connection, you take D of it, you take the result uh, of, of D of A, uh, here, you square it, and this makes it obvious that a Lagrangian is gauge invariant because this is a complex, so your gauge transformation just does not propagate all the way there. There is no analogous understanding of different variants for gravity, right, because this is not based on any complex. Now, let's 
well, this is a remark. I don't know if I should make it. There is some other off-shell formulation which is based on volume preserving diffeomorphs and Wiley scalings. This has been worked on, worked out recently in the literature, but it's not very relevant for what I'm going to say. It's just the fact that other, other off-shell, depending on the symmetry you put in, you can have other off-shell formulations. But let me also quickly show you the uh, complication one gets into if you work out perturbative uh, interac interactions. So for example, these formulae are from Gorov's Ignati Tulu paper. Uh, there is a gauge fixing term that was added to the Lagrangian. This is on arbitrary background. Uh, the linearized Lagrangian is quite complicated. This is the cubic uh, term of the Lagrangian. This is quartic. It's a mess, as you all know. So now let me proceed uh, to the formulation that I'm going to present. Uh, but to describe it, I need, I need the language. I need the language of spinners because uh, in the, the formulation that I, uh, the gravitons are most cleanly described using the language of spinners. So, well, I hope this is not too complicated language. So I'm in four dimensions. I have two types of spinner bundles, S plus and minus. Uh, a general irreducible representation of Lorentz is of the form you take some, well, symmetric tensor product of one of them, symmetric tensor product of another. This is the dimension of this representation. Uh, the usual vector representation is just S plus tensor S minus, right? The guy that has primed, unprimed, or dotted, undotted index. Uh, let me introduce also the notion of spin. Total spin of representation is just the total number of spin halves here. So it's just K plus N over two. And then uh, there are two types of differential operators that one can have. At least these are the operators that will be useful or you are useful for my way of thinking about this. So in one operator, you just take a spinner with a bunch of primed, unprimed indices. You act on it with D. Remember that D, well, what is meant by D here is really the covariant derivative. Well, this is the formula. You just take a spinner, you act on it with a covariant derivative. This adds two more indices. And then you symmetrize unprimed and primed. So clearly, this adds spin one. If you started with some spin, uh, you added one primed, one unprimed index, so you've added one, well, total spin that you added is one. There is another uh, operator uh, which does not change the spin. It simply maps, say, primed index into unprimed, converts primed into unprimed. This is known as a Dirac operator because we're, you're very used to this uh, in the context of spin half, right? Dirac operator acting on spin half uh, just converts primed index into unprimed. So this is the Dirac operator. And then let me draw some diagram. I find this diagram useful. Uh, so this is why I'm drawing it. Uh, one can start with functions. One can add with a D. So this is derivative of a function. Now it's spin one. And then one can keep building. Uh, here you act with Dirac operators. This doesn't change the spin, so this line is total spin one. Uh, then you can act another time with a D. This line is total spin two. Uh, in general, this diagram is not a complex and it is not a commutative diagram. So these squares in general do not commute. And the composition in general is non zero. But something special happens when curvature is special because, for example, well, if you go around the square this way and that way, what you measure, the difference is just a certain component of the curvature. So, uh, so for example, when while, while plus is equal to zero, uh, the right-hand side of this diagram will become commutative. So, for example, this square will become commutative. And uh, basically the same fact, the, the fact that square is commutative is for example, let's look at these arrows, this one and this one. There is nothing to complete the square here, so well, uh, this becomes a complex. The composition of these two is zero. So one can say it's also, well, it's the same fact as commutative squares. Anyway, uh, so for example, this part of the diagram becomes commutative if you go from S plus two to this space and to this space, uh, you get a zero. Uh, why this space is important. So uh, again, these are 
vector fields on the manifold. Uh, this S plus two is a cell is the same as cell dual two forms. Uh, this is where our metric gravitons would live. This is the trace free part of the graviton. It would live here. This is the trace of the graviton. And well, th these are the two spaces that will become important in my story. But importantly, this is a complex when while plus is equal to zero. Let's compare this complex to Maxwell complex. In Maxwell, uh, in the complex that underlies Maxwell theory in the way I describe it to you. Remember, I, I said that Maxwell equations can be written as d plus star d plus a is equal to zero. So there, is, there was some, some self-duality uh, added. Well, I made a preference here. I prefer self-dual objects to anti-self-dual, so, and I wrote Maxwell equations in this form. So um, Maxwell equations are based on this complex. I go again from functions to uh, potentials and then to the self-dual part of the field strengths. This is a complex. And then I'm comparing it to the complex that I had on the previous slide. Now let me just count dimensions of spaces that appear there. In the case of Maxwell, I have one, this is four, and this is three. And one can introduce a notion of number of degrees of freedom in a complex, which is basically you take this dimension minus this dimension, you get two. We know that two is the right number of degrees of freedom in, for any massless theory. And then if we just look at this complex, uh, compare again the numbers, we get the, the number of degrees of freedom in this complex is five minus three, it's again two. So we can suspect that this complex can be used to describe, uh, to describe two degrees of freedom, massless particles. So let me just write down the Lagrangian based on the complex in the sense that I, I just take an object there, I take a Dirac operator of it, I go to this space and then I square the result. So let me start with a Lagrangian like this. Uh, the claim is that this Lagrangian describes gravitons uh, on any uh, self-dual space. Why? Well, you can see that it has the right number of degrees of freedom. Uh, you can also see, well, just by counting the number of spinners appearing here, the number, total number of spinners is four. So this is a spin two representation. Therefore, this object is capable of describing spin two particle. Uh, and then you convince yourself that this is spin two. One most convincing way that I know of is just to take this Lagrangian, write it in some, for example, de Sitter space. Uh, do three plus one decomposition of this Lagrangian and see what, is, what it propagates. And you see that it, Hamiltonian analysis of this Lagrangian tells you that what it propagates are symmetric traceless transfers tensors on your spatial slice, exactly like the usual GR would give you. So this is, this is spin two particles. But you see, it's a much more simple Lagrangian than the Lagrangian we had before. Uh, this one now is a total square, right? It's based on a complex. Gauge invariance of this Lagrangian is element, I mean, because it's based on the complex, it's obvious that it's gauge invariant. Uh, uh, field equations are obtained, well, it's a square of some operator. Uh, gravitons of particular helicity are first order, ob I mean, objects satisfying first order differential equation and so on. Uh, one remark is that, well, when I say that these are gravitons, you would also like to know what the metric is. And the metric too, to understand what the metric is, is we should go to, to this diagram uh, we're basing our description of uh, spin two on objects here, but out of them one can take a derivative, Dirac operator, and obtain an object there. So this is, this is what the metric is. If you have a connection, well, that field on my, on my slide that satisfies this field equation, then you take a derivative. You go here, this object will satisfy linear Einstein's equation. This is the, the, the right graviton. Uh, so it's a very simple description of, of spin two particles that is very simple on any instant on space, right? The Lagrangian that I gave, this one, uh, this, this gives a description of massless spin two particles on any instant on. It's very simple. Um, but there is a price to pay for this simplicity. If you want to work in Lorentzian, uh, describe Lorentzian gravitons, 
uh, then you want your, the metrics that you obtain to be real. It's clear that uh, these objects, the objects there, they cannot be real because in Lorentzian signature, operation of complex conjugation into changes plus with minus, so there are no real objects here. If you take a complex conjugate of this object, you get in a different representation. So there cannot be any real objects there, unlike with gravitons. Gravitons, there can be real objects in S plus two, S minus two. There are no real objects there, but one can impose reality condition. The, real, the natural reality condition is that if you take an object there, you take a derivative of it, this object must be real. Uh, this reality condition can be expressed as a differential equation of the sort uh, complex conjugate connection is basically, well, it's delta. Maybe I write it like this. You see that if you take a complex conjugation, you end up in this space, and you can get to this space by taking derivative twice. So if you impose a differential equation like this, this is a possible reality condition, and it turns out that this is the same reality condition as the reality condition saying that graviton is real. So the price to pay in this description of gravitons is that you have to impose reality conditions. This, this object cannot be real. But You're only talking about linearized. Yeah, this is just linearized. Yeah, this is just linearized description, nothing else. And final comment here is that this object there is, well, I told you that uh, description will be based on connections, but this object there is not in any sense a connection. And this is related to the fact that uh, diffeomorphisms didn't act in any way in this space. So now this story that, uh, well, and this is also passage to nonlinear description uh, to combine, well, or to see the connection arising and also to see diffeomorphisms acting. In fact, I need to take two spaces. I need to take this space as well as this. This is the space of just vector fields. I need to put them together in this space. This is not an irreducible space. It decomposes into these two as irreducibles. And now this object is, in a certain sense, a connection because, well, one can think about this. Uh, it's a three-dimensional space, tensor, four-dimensional space. This is the space-time index now. So this object is a connection. And in fact, diffeomorphisms can now act because they simply shift this component of the connection, shift it arbitrarily just by, by your diffeomorphism simply shifts uh, this component. And in particular, this is why in the previous description I didn't need this other component. It's, it's trivially set to zero by, by diffeomorphism. So anyway, now I explained to you how the description that I presented can be related to connections. And I will go to nonlinear description. Uh, well, this slide, I don't know if I should explain it. It's, it's a slide which tells you how schematically how this description of gravity works. In this description of gravity, there is a connection. Metric is a derivative of the connection. And you can also form curvature, which is, uh, well, it's another derivative of the connection, let's say. I'll explain all this as we proceed. Field equation is a statement that some second derivative of the connection is equal to the connection. And then let's look at, uh, let's look what happens with Ricci. Uh, the, the statement now is that when field equation for the connection is satisfied, uh, Einstein equation for this metric is satisfied. Let's see how it can be. Uh, Einstein equation is a statement that Ricci is equal to G. Ricci is second derivative of the metric. It's the third derivative of this connection. But when this field equation is satisfied, I can replace third with first. And this is the metric again. So this is how <laughs> Einstein equation can be satisfied when this equation is satisfied. And again, on shell, on these equations, vial of the metric can be related to the curvature of this connection. So this is what happens on solutions of equations of motion for the connection. Metric becomes a derivative of the connection and curvature of this connection gets identified with vial of the metric. So it becomes the, the curvature. And now let me explain the nonlinear formulation. This nonlinear formulation uh, 
it's a, well, the action of the theory is some functional of the connection. It's a functional that is written without using any structure on, on space. You don't have anything apart from the connection. So there is no metric, absolutely nothing. And you just write something that makes sense. Uh, so you write an object which you can integrate to form an action. Um, you, you form this object as some non-polynomial function of the curvature. And it's this particular non-polynomial function that plays the role of GR functional. And I should explain what this is. So let me write a few more formulas. So F, which F, now let me add indices. Fi, which Fj, I is one, two, three. These are my Lie algebra indices. This is Lie algebra value two form. Uh, the product is, well, it's some four form with values. And I can always say that this is some four form, some fiducial four form, which I choose on my space, times a matrix. And then uh, I will consider functions of X which satisfy properties. They are gauge invariant, so F of orthogonal transformation, X orthogonal transformation transposed is F of X. And two, these functions are homogeneity degree one alpha F of X. For any such function, I define F of F which F. It's a definition. This is F of X times the volume. I first split my, my F which F as volume times a matrix. Then I apply my function to the matrix. I know how to do. Multiply it by the volume. And the right hand side is clearly because of uh, homogeneity. It does not depend on how you split volume. You can multiply all this. This is ambiguous. It's modular multiplication of volume by omega squared and dividing x by omega squared. But the right hand side here is unambiguously defined. And this is what is meant there. Uh, it's a particular function. So f g r of x is it's a trace of the square root of x. Square root of x. x is a symmetric matrix. Square root of x is another symmetric matrix. Uh, with some branch of the square root taken. There is a subtlety there, but it's another symmetric matrix. I take a trace of it, and then I take a square. Uh, it's homogeneity degree one function, and it's gauge invariant because trace is taken. So it satisfies these requirements, and therefore I can apply, no, well, therefore I can write this Lagrangian. This Lagrangian now makes sense. So, so square, square root is meant in the sense I mean, I mean, is there some ambiguity in the square? There is ambiguity. And actually, this ambiguity is interesting. So, well, one particular way to address this ambiguity is to say, um, I mean, let's, consider, let's consider definite matrix X, X, which, well, with, after we diagonalize, all eigenvalues have the same sign, and then there is no zero. And then we take a positive square root. This is one way to address it. But this only covers some of Einstein metrics to get all Einstein metrics, uh, you, need, maybe, maybe uh, you need other branches. So basically, all branches correspond to something physical. This can be analyzed on examples, and you need all branches of the square root. And then the statement is that uh, if you write Euler Lagrange equations following from this functional, I can write them. So Euler Lagrange equations is a statement that covariant derivative of, I'll write it as df by dx by j, fj is equal to zero. f is the function that I introduced there. df by dx, well, it's a matrix of first derivative of the function f. Actually, this is now an unambiguously defined object because it has a homogeneity degree zero. So the field equations is just a statement that some two forms, Lie algebra value two form, this one, is uh, covariantly constant. Of course, this is understood in the sense of exterior derivative. So there is a wedge product there. It's a field equation. It's clear that it's second order in derivatives because this object is first order in derivatives. It's non-polynomial in F, but it's just first order in, in uh, derivatives. It, it's, it's just a function of F. 
and therefore there are only second derivatives present here. So it's some second order PD, and the statement is that when connection satisfies all the Lagrange equation, some metric that you can construct from the connection is Einstein of non-zero scalar curvature, namely the cosmological constant is non-zero. How do you con how do you construct the metric? Any question? Uh, you construct the metric uh, using some possibility that exists in four dimensions. Uh, in four dimensions, conformal metrics can be encoded into knowledge of which two forms are self-dual. This is a well-known fact. Well, it, it re this fact is explained by this isomorphism of homogeneous group spaces. But let me just assume that this is so. So if you know which two forms are self-dual, you know conformal metric. Actually, I can write a formula for this. So the claim is that if you have a triple of two forms, which you want to be self-dual, then you can write down a metric which makes them self-dual. And this metric is G mu proportional to epsilon alpha beta gamma delta F just, just, I have B, one, two, three. So I write B, one, uh, mu alpha. Well, in fact, I better write in this is I, J, K. So B, I, mu alpha, B, J, mu beta, B, K, gamma delta. So the statement is that this conformal metric makes this triple of two forms. Sorry, there is also epsilon I, J, K. This conformal metric makes the triple of two forms B, self-dual. This is, this is this fact written as a formula. So the way a metric is constructed is you just declare, you first construct conformal metric. You declare curvature to be self-dual. It's a definition. Uh, you get the conformal metric out of this via this formula, for example. You just put three curvatures. Well, you put fi, fj, fk here. Uh, to complete the definition, you need to specify the volume of the metric, and you just, the volume is multiple of this function that appears in the Lagrangian. So that the Lagrangian is actually just the volume, total volume of the space with this definition. There are some factors here. There is an I, because I'm thinking in terms of Lorentzian signature. If you are Euclidean, then there is no I there. There is also a factor of scalar curvature. All these other factors, these lambdas are not very important. They're just there. To, pick, to keep track of where lambda appears in the story. But, so the important point here is that once you define, so uh, if you have a connection, out of a connection you can define a particular metric. I gave you the definition. You write the, you write the Lagrangian, uh, which is just, or the, the action is just the total volume of the space. Uh, if you did that in the metric context, you wouldn't get any non-trivial differential equations as all Lagrange equations, but here, because the metric is a first derivative of the connection, we do get non-trivial field equations, and these are our field equations on the connection. Okay, well, here is just a slide to show you how compact the perturbative expansion of this action becomes. Uh, for example, you take the sitter space and start expanding the connection around the connection that corresponds to the sitter space. <laughs> This is the full cubic uh, expansion. There are just three terms. Probably one can even combine this with this, but I didn't try too hard. But the, the minimum number is probably two terms there. Anyway, the, this, the number of terms that appears in the complete offshell cubic vertex is much, much smaller than, again, this slide. Right? There, there are lots of terms there. So we do get more compact expressions in these perturbative expansions. Another nice fact about this formulation is that you can describe instantons very, very simply in this language. Instanton, the condition for connection to correspond to an instanton is just this. F or GF is delta. It's clearly first order condition on the connection. So connections which satisfy these first order PDs, if you construct a metric out of them in the way I described, that metric will be an instanton. It will be self-dual Einstein with non-zero lambda. So there is a very, very simple way instantons are described. Actually, there is a connection from here to twister description of instantons, and Yannick 
we'll talk about it <coughs> tomorrow. And in the time that I have, well, yeah, another point. I already uh, kind of described it to you on the, on the board. The only thing that you need to write an action is just some function on matrices satisfying these properties. The function that corresponds to GI is just one function with these properties. It's a very nice function. It's in a certain sense it's preferred, but there are other functions as well. You can see this because such functions are really just functions of eigenvalues because they're, they're gauge invariant functions of symmetric matrices. They're just functions of eigenvalues. So F is really just F of lambda one, lambda two, lambda three, where X is a diagonal lambda one, lambda two, lambda three. And the only thing that is required from this function is that it's homogeneity degree one. There are, of course, many functions like this, right? So, you, for example, you can say that f is just lambda one times arbitrary function of lambda two over lambda one, lambda three over lambda one. Well, there are lots of lots of functions satisfying so the homogeneity con condition. So... But you might want to see permutation symmetry as well. Okay, so yeah. Yeah, but it's clear that there are other ones as well. Yeah. So it looks like there are other theories here. Uh, all this, well, the, the, the field equation that will follow from this Lagrangian is this one. It's still second order PD on the connection. Another fact about this theory is if you linearize this uh, action around, say, an instanton, uh, linearization is always the same. So all these theories are about gravitons just because linearization is always the same. What is different about them is just interactions. So we get a, a very large family of gravity theories, right? Let me characterize these gravity theories for you in some detail because, well, I think they're, inter well, they're interesting. So, and, well, it's, so let me spend some time on them. Uh, one way to characterize these other gravity theories is by computing scattering amplitudes, right? Because in, on shell, you, you, once you compute your interaction vertices on shell, you know what you're talking about. And it turns out that these other theories, uh, they can be characterized as theories uh, mostly or all minus amplitudes are equal to zero, mostly minus, namely one plus is equal to zero. This is like in GR, right? But all plus amplitudes are not equal to zero and amplitudes with just one minus are not equal to zero. So this is different from GR. One can immediately down the Lagrangian, which mimics that, right? You just start adding powers of the self-dual part of vial. This will have such properties. Uh, but what is interesting here is that if you start writing Lagrangians like this, uh, if you truncate this expansion, you have theory with more propagating degrees of freedom, right? Just because you have more derivatives in this Lagrangian. Uh, in the connection language, such Lagrangians come and they're automatically, well, you know that there are just two propagating degrees of freedom there because they are, by, by, by construction, they are second order PDs. Uh, field equations are just second order PDs. So you manage to describe Lagrangians like this, uh, starting from some, second, oh, from some second order Lagrangians for the connection. This is the non-trivial aspect of this story. Uh, okay, and... Uh, this I skip. Let me just, in the time remaining, let me explain the spherical asymmetric solution. I find this nice, and it also illustrates how this theory works in practice. Uh, so let me start with some spherical asymmetric ansatz for the connection. It's a connection invariant on the SU2 uh, and invariant on the shifts. So nothing depends on time. This is why it's invariant on the R. And it's invariant on the SU2 in the sense that, well, if you do diffeomorphism along a sphere, uh, the result, the lead derivative of the connection along that vector field is just a gauge transformation. So it's a particular SU2 times R invariant connection. Of course, if you started from Schwarzschild metric and computed the cell dual part of Levi Civita, you would obtain a connection of this form. But here we're just starting with connection of this form. A and B are two arbitrary functions. Uh, then I, I just, well, I follow the steps. How would I solve? Well, I, what I need to solve are these equations. So first I form, I compute the curvatures. This is an easy exercise, right? F is just dA plus A wedge A. These are the curvature components. Um, then I compute the matrix X. Matrix X is diagonal. This is very easy to see because F1 wedge F2 is zero. 
it's always. And the nicest way to write this matrix X, remember matrix X is defined on only modular multiplication by some four form. So this is what is meant by this proportionality factor. I can always, what I don't like, or I can always cancel something, some common factor from X. This is also clear uh, from this way of writing field equations, right? This is homogeneity degree zero. It doesn't matter which conformal representative of X I take here. The field equation explicitly depends only on X modular rescalings. So I write, I take a particular, I, I cancel a particular four form out and my X11 is just log A prime, where prime is a derivative with respect to my radial coordinate and X22 is equal to X33 is equal to that. So this is matrix X. Then I substitute everything into field equations. And at this stage, I don't want to specify which theory I'm talking about. This is a very nice point. I just keep my function f general for as long as I can. I, I don't want to say that I work with GR. I work with some theory of this sort. It turns out that equations take a very, very simple form. Uh, there are two different equations. Well, they take this form. Uh, well, the third equation, the 3, 3 equation is the same as 2, 2. This is clear because I, uh, my F2, 2 was equal to F, my F2 was equal to F3 or X2, 2 was equal to X3, 3. Also, these, even these equations are not uh, linear in, linearly independent uh, because of gauge invariance. In fact, they are, one can manipulate with them. So, in fact, there is just one of these equations uh, in, this, in the game because of, there is some Bianchi identity that relates them. Uh, and so the only thing that you could do here is, right, I, I said that A and B are just functions of radial coordinate, but which radial coordinate? I can take arbitrary radial coordinates. So of course I cannot determine my A and B because there is no preferred radi radial coordinate. I cannot determine A and B as functions of radial coordinate because there is no preferred radi radial coordinate. So there's really only one equation which I can think about as it tells me A as a function of B. But if you look at these equations, there is a very convenient uh, choice of radial coordinate to be made. If you look at right-hand side, it's the same for both equations. And um, under, because x, if I look at x, x contains a derivative with respect to radial coordinate. Uh, Reparametrizing the radial coordinate multiplies x by, well, because X is some, well, it's D by DR of something, right? Uh, Reparametrizing R maps X into X times, if I go to R of R, there is some D big R by D small R, right? There is some transformation. And so I can uh, now use this freedom of reparametrizing radial coordinate to make a convenient choice of coordinate and I just choose the right-hand side to be one. That's my choice of radial coordinate. Once I do this, these equations are trivially solved. Well, this is what, this is what the solutions are. Uh, importantly, this is a solution for arbitrary function f. So if you tell me what f is, I, I solve this because this is just algebraic in x. I solve for x in terms of radial coordinate. And once I solve x in terms of radial coordinate, I can go back and solve for A and B in terms of the same radial coordinate. So the most important step of integration is done here. So this, this solves the problem completely for arbitrary function f. And now let me specialize to what happens in GR. In GR I have f of x is trace square root squared. Uh, this is the matrix of first derivatives. So this immediately gives me the solution for x11, one, one, x22 two, two in terms of r. This is just simple integration. Then integrating one more, one more step gives me A and B in terms of R. So in principle, this is a complete solution for A and B for the connection in terms of some good radial coordinate. Uh, there is no metric here, right? Because uh, uh, I didn't mention the metric at all. It was just solving some second order PDs for the connection, or uh, in, in this case, ODs for the connection. Now I can remember about my metric and I can compute it. So the metric, uh, remember the definition was that you start with a connection and then you compute some metric. It's, it's conformal classes such that curvatures are self-dual and then there is some volume form. 
you just follow those definitions, you compute what the metric is, it's that. It takes a spherically symmetric form. The A and B and primes are those functions that we had. Uh, well, and then, then one knows that what sits in front here is the preferred radial coordinate from the metric viewpoint. You look at this, uh, you compare the radial coordinate of Schwarzschild with the radial coordinate that you introduced, you find this relation, and then the metric immediately becomes the usual Schwarzschild ADS metric. So actually this step is most, uh, there is most labor there in the calculation. Solving for the connection is very, very easy. The mo most of the work that you do is, for example, computing the metric and then doing this. This is somewhat painful. Uh, okay, this was an illustration how this formalism works. And I will summarize. So there were two main points here. Uh, it's possible to describe gravitons uh, using a different irreducible representation of the Lorentz group. Uh, the usual description is S plus two, S minus two. This is H mu nu. And I used S plus three, S minus. It's a different representation for us. It's also possible to describe gravitons using that. If you do this, uh, your linearized uh, field equations become very, very simple. Uh, they become, well, the operator that appears is a square of some differential operator, and there is some underlying complex. It's a very, very nice description, completely mimicking what happens in the case of Maxwell. Uh, a nonlinear description based on this idea is also possible. It, it leads to field equation like this. Uh, you can also do perturbative expansion. Perturbative expansion is simpler, uh, simpler interaction vertices. Well, as I said, nonlinear description is also possible. Uh, and the interesting aspect of what is possible when you play the game with connections instead of the metrics is that you get alternative gravity theories of an interesting type. And I will end with a remark that, so uh, in my opinion, this formulation is in some aspects simpler than einstein hilbert uh, but of course it's it's still quite complicated. <laughs> it's, uh, but I strongly believe that, well, in particular, results on graviton scattering amplitudes and so on. There is some other formulation, off-shell formulation of GR out there. And I think it's very important to look for it. Uh, so this, this formulation is probably just a step uh, towards finding this other formulation, the type of formulation that I would uh, declare to be the simplest formulation of gravity would be the one where the interaction is just cubic. It's an off-shell for, for off formulation with some Lagrangian where you just have cubic interaction of your gravitons. This would be the dream formulation. Um, maybe it exists, and I think we should all look for it. And I will end with a quote from Feynman, a quote which I like a lot. So you can read it yourself. Thank you. Question or comments? Would you recall that you actually have some DF type theory? Uh, in fact, yeah, 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 it came. Uh, remember, I started from Eddington idea. Uh, the way I presented it was you take some first order description and then integrate something out. So uh, the way this connection formulation is obtained is you take some BF type of action and you integrate out the B field. That's one way to think where this pure connection formulation comes from. So, so it does look like nature's thrown a line with matrix, but maybe it's not a formulation comes from. Maybe not with zero. What, what's it mean to you? There is no cosmological constant. Well, if there is no cosmological constant, you cannot have this formulation. That's, you cannot describe gravity in terms of connections. So if the, what you can do, you can use it as do. For example, you can uh, compute Minkowski space scattering amplitudes, starting from a formulation like this, which requires lambda. Uh, you set up something, and then eventually, at the end of the calculation, you take lambda to zero. So it, the fact that lambda seems to be so small, I've got one over lambda depending everywhere, that's not a problem. 
well, actually, it's very, it's very good because uh, this makes the number in front of the action very large. And this large number in front of the action is explanation why gravity is so classical, right? This is like one of h bar. So this is gravity becomes very classical, also very weakly interacting. Because this is what large number in front of the action means. So it's, it's good. It's No, I haven't tried. <coughs> I think it's po something is possible. Well, one easy thing to do is you just take, well, you take this Lagrangian, but replace the gauge group. Uh, this is SU2, so you super symmetrize it. For example, you take OSP21, something like this, and you write the same Lagrangian. Uh, well, this is possible, but I don't know what it describes. I make no claims that this is super gravity, but it may be. I mean, there are uh, super specular versions of these um, Lavansky. Right, yeah, forms. yeah, yeah. So, quite yeah, easy. yeah. The, the transition, transition, transition may be complicated. Yeah. Well, it can't be that quite. Uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So I'm sure that uh, supergravity with cosmological constant, there exists a pure connection description of it. You just you write it in first order form, you integrate out your metric. This is possible. But whether this is practical, I don't know. For example, even coupling gravity to scalar field, in principle, it's possible to integrate out the metric. But in practice, it's, you don't get any nice action this way. So I don't know whether you can get anything nice by doing that. Further question. Okay. So you talked about how you have this uh, function f and how in principle you can use it to construct theories other than G. Right. And I'm wondering how does this get around um, Lovelock theorem? We are in four dimensions, so I think uh, there is nothing Lovelock says in four dimensions. Well, doesn't Lovelock tell you mean that the gravity is unique, right? You want to say that gravity is unique or what? GR is, GR is unique, yes, GR is unique, yes, but of course we can add these higher curvature terms to it, right? This, this does not conflict. Uh, you see, uh, if you add one term like this, you add high derivative terms. So Lovelock is about second ordering derivatives, right? There is no conflict uh, between adding a term like this to your gravity Lagrangian and Lovelock's theorem, because Lovelock's theorem is about uniqueness of second order uh, gravitational theories. Right, uh, and of course I can keep adding these terms. So if I add one, I have more derivatives. But if I have infinite, I don't know how many I have, because I have to resum this, and there is a way to resum. So then you can sort of say that you get around it by having too many yes. terms. Yes. Yeah. How do you couple it to non-gravitational matter? Uh, perturbatively very easy. You just write down the vertex. At the level of the action, I, I, there is no simple way. Uh, and actually, uh, that is possible. Yeah, you get some interesting theories, but of course you can't get anything. I mean, you can get everything this way. You can, you can get something interesting, but not. For example, you can probably get, or you can get gravity coupled to Yen-Mills this way by enlarging the gauge group, but uh, this has not been explored too, too much. And probably this is another reason uh, why this Eddington formulation has never been developed. Well, it's the same problem with Eddington, right? How do you couple matter to this? So one should view this reformulation as maybe it's another way to look at pure gravity. Uh, for some purposes, it's a very convenient way because it's, it simplifies some things. Uh, whether it's a physically relevant formulation of gravity, I, I wouldn't say so because in particular because of the problem, how do you couple matter to it? So you should view it more as a mathematically interesting trick to reformulate Einstein equations and maybe get something out of it. Yes, me. Yeah, at one loop, uh, what uh, the calculations I've done are uh, heat kernel calculations. And just because 
the, the operator that you get. Very nice. Oh, you see, this is the linearized field equation. So the operators that you get are very nice here. It's much easier to do heat kernel calculations. You get much, much more compact objects. This is one point. Another point, interesting point, is that in this version of gravity, the scalar part of the graviton, the trace of H menu, is simply not present at all. In metric formulation of gravity, you need to take care of trace of H menu. It's there, it offshell, it, it's there, you need to integrate over it. Eventually, determinants that you can construct, the scalar determinants cancel each other in the, in the final answer in the usual metric language. Here, the scalar is simply not present. Uh, this is a very interesting aspect. It makes things simpler because you never have to worry about the scalar. Uh, some other perturbative calculations are possible as well. You can start computing diagrams. This I've also explored, but uh, well, there's n n nothing amazing happening. You, you can do these calculations, yes. That I didn't explore. No, it's possible. I mean, these other actions. Or Sorry. The, the interesting, interesting possibility here is to explore thermodynamics changing the theory, to thinking about different Fs. I don't know if this is what you mean. Because with different F, the thermodynamics will change, as we know. It's, it's a, well, it's a good PhD project, but I didn't explore it. I didn't explore this too much, no. no. So this particular gravity seems carved, right? Yes, this one is, so yeah. does it always stay like this? Or can you pick an F such that it becomes non parallel The only one is GR. So the chirality is encoded in the third power of plus there and first power of minus. Yeah, well, the fact that it's a chiral representation suggests that almost anything you will get out will be chiral. So and the question is whether you can still find at least something that's non-chiral. GR is the only thing that is non-chiral. Uh -huh. GR will, well, it doesn't have all these terms. The amplitudes for GR are chiral, and it seems that GR is the only theory in this class which is non-chiral. So if you want, this is the GR uniqueness in this language. If you want unitarity, which is relation between this, well, unitarity means that there is a relation between these amplitudes. There is no relation between these amplitudes here. So these theories are non-unitary as theories of interacting gravitons in Minkowski space. So if you impose unitarity then, GR is the only theory.